Welcome to this video on top, uh, the top 10 reasons why Java is a top development environment for embedded developer systems. My name is Roger Brinkley and uh, the reason why we're doing this particular video at this point in time is because last Tuesday the JDK 8 early access release for ARM with Java FX was released and this particular release is uh, primarily indicated or primarily uh, dedicated for ARM processors. Uh, it is an early release of JDK 8, so you get all of the new functionality that's coming in JDK 8, like the uh, Lambda, Lambda um, uh, con uh, constructs. But um, this is, is primarily an opportunity for the ARM uh, developers to go out and kick the tires of JDK 8 before JDK 8 releases sometime in the late 2013. Now, specifically, this release has another key feature in it, and that is the support for hard floating point support. And this was uh, primarily tested on the Raspberry Wheezy uh, OS with ARM v6 hard floating, uh, floating point support. Another key feature in here in this release was an optimized version of JavaFX for, uh, for Linux versions. This particular uh, release uh, is not the final optimized JavaFX that will go in, but it is at least an optimized version uh, that, will go, uh, that, that will combine very nicely with the hard floating point. And we should see what developers were seeking is a little bit faster response time when it comes to the uh, JavaFX displays as they come on a Raspberry uh, machine. Additionally, you'll find demos and samples um, in this particular release that uh, are out there for you to try, making it very easy for you to test to see that things are actually working on the Raspberry Pi uh, that you have and uh, that the um, implementation is there. Now, by chance, if you don't want to be able to run on a headless system, uh, there's no problem with that because uh, there is support for headless ARM um, in, in these environments as well. Uh, it's just simply run without the JavaFX uh, implementation in there. Uh, and then uh, additionally, uh, this was just tested, as we said before, on the Raspberry Wheezy OS, an ARM uh, 6 hard floating point, uh, but it should work on other ARM processors. So given that, why uh, the question kind of arises as to why would uh, ARM developers or even embedded developers be interested in doing implementation on, uh, on Java? And so we're going to give you 10 reasons today why uh, Java is the top embedded platform. So number one, it decouples software development from the hardware development cycle. Now traditionally when you were looking at the development cycle um, for, for, for Java with hardware and software, what you would find would be that you would almost have a waterfall effect of hardware development, uh, maybe do a prototype of hardware development, do some software, do some more hardware development, do some more software, and this constant cycle that would go around. And so this could lead to two or more redevelopment phases that would occur. But with embedded Java, the hardware and the software are really independent. And so because the hardware is really decoupled, that allows the specific work to be carried out within the software environment. And so this is, this is going to, to break that waterfall cycle that we talked about. And now, that you can, now you can just do the hardware development and software development in parallel. There will be times when you'll want to test out the software on the hardware at, at various points in time. But it should at least eliminate or reduce the need for respins that would normally occur. This means that your development focus can now be on product development and validation. Number two, the development and testing using standard development and testing can use standard desktop systems through emulations. Now, because we've decoupled the hardware from the software, we don't have to do our, our, our software uh, design and, and testing on the hardware platform. We can use an emulation of that hardware platform on our standard de desktop systems, and particularly our, our desktop systems that have our programming environments on them. Now, that's going to speed up our development cycle because we really don't need that hardware in there anymore. We can actually go through and the software can be fixed and redefined and refactored without having to do that hardware testing. Of course, that doesn't mean that in the end we aren't going to do some, some hardware testing. We absolutely do need to run the software on the hardware in the end because there will be some differences between the emulated environment and the actual final environment. Although because our, our, our emulated environment is going to be using pretty much the same um, software as what's going to be running on, on, on our platform, our final platform, we shouldn't see very many changes at all. Number three, 
Java is a highly productive language with APIs, uh, runtime, and tools, and that's going to equal a quick time to market. So the Java development environment, when we look at what's in that environment, we can look at it as in, in the two uh, or two distinct areas. One is the Java development environment itself and the Java development tools. When we look at the Java development environment, that's the Java virtual machine, the, the, the machine that executes the byte codes that were generated by the Java C compiler itself. Now the Java language is what we're going to write our code in, and so that's a very important part of, 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 of um, the piece, the new Lambda APIs that are coming in, and, and uh, they're all part of, of this next piece, which is the robust Java APIs. And so we talk about our APIs. Um, when we were first developing, when I was first developing with C and I first moved over to Java, I was like, wow, look at all of these, these libraries that I have access to, URL, I don't have to worry about trying to figure out how to set all that stuff up or write my own libraries, it's all there for me. And so there's this whole set of robust uh, Java APIs. We're talking about trying to display something. JavaFX is one of those robust APIs or a whole series of robust APIs here. And then finally, of course, the Java development tools that exist out there. So NetBeans, Eclipse, IntelliJ, where you can run the entire environment. You can test the, the, the prototypes of what you're doing. You can provide stop and breakpoints, uh, do your recycling of everything that we have to do based upon what we were talking about previously and, and um, uh, in, in that environment. The key part is that your development time is significantly reduced and products can actually ship a lot sooner. Now, if we take a quote, take a look at a quote here that comes from Charles Nutter, and you can see some of that speed and that development time. So he says in, in one of his, uh, you know, his Twitter feed a while back, he said, every time I see a piece of C code I need to port, my heart dies a little. And then I port it a quarter of a much, uh, uh, to a quarter as much Java, and I feel better. Well, that's pretty much the response that a lot of people have seen when they've moved from C to Java is that they can do things in about a quarter amount of time is what they've been able to do in the past. Number four, create a high-performance, portable, secure, robust cross-platform applications easily. This is primarily done because of all of the features of Java are really high performant, portable, secure, robust, and cross-platform. The JIT compiler right now, as far as high performance goes, is approaching the speed of C or C++ code. And the fact is, in some cases, it's exceeding that time period. Now, when we talk about Java ME and Java SE, they, have, they are really optimized for a smaller footprint. So they run very robustly in those environments. And when we're talking about the, the, the portability, the Java bytecode itself makes the language extremely platform independent, which means that we can develop on one platform or we can actually develop in our in, in the emulated environment and we can put it on one platform or another platform and we can execute on a whole variety of platforms out there. And what that means is that we avoid uh, platform lock-in. So as we want to switch from maybe an ARM processor to an x86 or a PAR architecture, we can do that. Then Java program is confined to its Java execution environment. And what that really is referring to is the security environment. Java works in its own sandbox, a sandbox environment that you want to, want to create. It doesn't get out of its sandbox, or rarely gets out of its sandbox. And so that means that you're in a secure environment, you know that your operating system is safe, and the execution of the program is going to be limited to the, what it has to do. Finally, cross-platform Java works on a variety of ARM v5, v6, v7, x86, and power architecture for Linux, all of which are very good uh, a set of platforms, cross-platforms for the embedded developer to work in. Take a look at some of the speed that's going on, and Richard Baer had just done some experiments with the early access release, and he was talking about this in, in the FX Experience blog, and he said JDK 8 is a hotspot based VM, so it's really quite zippy. Now, he was doing some tests on prime numbers in, in, in this blog, and so he says, I cranked up the test to find all the prime numbers below 50,000. Well, as you can see, hotspots faster than the native code. And this is just one example that we see here of this. I want to read more about what Richard Bear has to say about the early access release. Go to his FX Experience blog, and you can find in more information there. Number five, Java isolates your apps from the language and platform variations. 
We know that when we look at various platforms, we know that the C or C++ may not be the same on each platform. The kernel might be a little bit different, or there can be libc differences. The nice thing is, is that the Java Virtual Machine, those platform, virtu uh, those platform variations are managed by the virtual machine, so you don't have to worry about that. So gone are the problems of memory corruption, stack overflows, and other type of bugs, which are you know, really kind of difficult and extremely difficult to isolate. Number six, the most popular embedded processors are supported, allowing design flexibility. So we talk about JavaFX uh, in, in this particular release for the early access release. JavaFX supported on ARM architecture, v6 and, and uh, 7, with the hard float support there. Uh, but then also, if you're not going to use JavaFX, uh, ARM architecture, v6 and v7 with, with uh, a hard float, obviously, if you don't use JavaFX, it's still going to run there. ARM architecture, v7, um, VFP, Little Indian, ARM architecture, v5, soft float, Little Indian. Linux x86 and power architecture. And then finally, when we're looking at the ME environment, the ARM Keel development board based on the ARM Cortex M3 quarters uh, will be coming out soon. Number seven, support for key embedded features such as low footprint, power management, low latency. So when we look at all of our devices that are running in the Java environment, all of them are constrained in some way or another. Uh, even the even your devices that are sitting in your in your server farms are constrained, but when we're talking about embedded space, they're often constrained on RAM or ROM or maybe fluctuating power um, or some type of power constraint there. And, and typically, that has to do with with an environmental constraint, or it might be a, uh, related to a uh, a cost constraint. The good thing is, is that when it comes to memory resources, Java ME embedded can be run in 130k bytes of RAM to 350k bytes of RAM of ROM, or up to uh, 700k bytes of RAM to 150k bytes of ROM. So that's a great environment for the small, tight embedded systems. When we talk about Java SE embedded itself, it can run in as low as 32 megabytes of RAM or 39 megabytes of ROM, which is uh, pretty substantial when it comes to low memory resources easy enough to run on any Raspberry Pi that you would buy today. But all these systems are ideally optimized systems so that um, things like dedicated embedded functionality like uh, always on or, or intermittent supply or headless uh, and connected devices, uh, these environments have been uh, targeted specifically for that, for that environment. Number eight, you can leverage a huge developer, developer ecosystem, the expertise, the existing coding. There are nine million developers out there in the world that, are, that know Java. And that's, that's a huge resource pool when it comes to getting developers to work on your particular project. Additionally, there's some existing code and training that exists in a variety of places. One is the Java Embedded Community on Java.net, and the others are a variety of conferences. We just recently held the Java Embedded Conference at Java One uh, back in October. We're looking at doing at least one of those regionally around the world. Additionally, you'll be able to find Java at the Freescale Technology Forums, and so you'll find uh, the environment there. And then finally, there's a new uh, embedded development uh, uh, conference that's coming out. It's called JFocus Embedded 2013. It'll be in Stockholm if you're in Europe. Uh, it's in the first week of February. I really encourage you to take a look at that conference and, and become involved with it. Number nine, you can easily create end-to-end -end solutions integrated with Java backend services. So the, the Internet of Things are really not doing a, a, an autonomous task. I say single task here, but really autonomous task. Um, take a look at an embedded drink dispenser. It's taking, uh, you know, it may be able to take a credit card payment, so it's got to communicate it back to the credit card company. Um, it may be um, the, the company that's, when it sells uh, a particular beverage, uh, that beverage may be, may be monitored by the beveraging uh, company itself so that it knows when to restock or how much is being sold of a particular beverage so that they can keep things just in time, um, so they can have just in time inventory. Um, and, and lower their inventory costs associated with that. 
talk about an embedded house powering power monitoring system and and uh, you may want to in, if your house is uh, if the house power is monitored in your system you might want to turn the lights out using something like your cell phone or from a web application um, or the uh, power company itself may be monitoring how much power you're actually using and, and uh, may reward you for uh, using power at a different time but they may also be monitoring the system to know okay we need to uh, we need to make sure this this organization has more power or less power or uh, you know something along those lines. What's good is it's good for collecting and uh, what's really important here is that in all of those systems is the collecting and transferring of data securely to some Java backend server. Now it doesn't necessarily have to be a Java backend server, but it certainly is is great when it is. But the key part there is securely transferring that data, and both Java SE and ME have some very secure environments to where you can do that, and the technology is there. Unlike some other um, uh, implementations that are out there that are really not securely based when it comes to transferring this information. Then there's also the possibility because on the SE embedded system you can also include a GlassFish server and a database as well so some analysis might actually be able to be done on the embedded device. Fact is you might even turn that embedded device into a uh, uh, some, some type of server itself to where it would respond and, uh, to requests of information from it. But the key part here is that it's an end-to-end -end Java solution. So let's turn to our last piece, which is number 10, the solutions. There's a whole bunch of solutions from constrained devices to server class systems. We can take a look at some of the examples that are set here. So the LiveScribe pin, which is really an autonomous type of pin situation. Uh, the Kindle device. Um, the Blu-ray player, Cisco's advanced voice over IP phone, Cronus InTouch smart time clock, uh, Energy ICT smart metering, EDF's automated meter management, Ricoh printers, the Stanford automated car when you're talking about really moving up into you know, higher type of management systems. I mean, think about the car. It ran up Pikes Peak by itself. Variety of systems that are inside there, they're all Java-based. Um, did much better than the uh, helicopter that was, um, that was uh, filming it. So the top 10 reasons why Java is the top environment for embedded development. Number one, it decouples software development from hardware development cycles. Number two, the development and testing using standard desktop systems for emulation. Number three, highly productive language, APIs, and runtime and tools is going to equal a quick time to market. Number four, Create high-performance, portable, secure, robust, cross-platform applications easily. Five, Java isolates your apps from the language and platform variations. Number six, most of the popular embedded processors are supported, allowing design flexibility. Number seven, support for key embedded features, low footprint, power management, low latency. Number eight, leverage huge Java developer ecosystem, expertise, existing code, that 9 million developers that are out there. Number nine, easily create end-to-end -end solutions integrated with Java backend services. And number 10, solutions that exist already out there from constrained devices to, to uh, server class systems. So as we said earlier, uh, the JDK Early Access release for ARM with JavaFX is out there, ready to use, kick the tires. Duke gives it a big thumbs up. He says, get it out there, run your Raspberry Pi on it, and don't forget, make the future Java.